want to welcome to the 11:30 Wednesday uh, lunch and Bible study. Uh, while you're eating, I'm I'm teaching you. I'll feed you from the Word of God as you feed your physical body. I'll feel I'll feed your soul uh, from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We start a new series of of lessons today. We're going to uh, study the days of Noah. That will be the title of the series of lessons uh, from Genesis 6 through 9. But I'm going to take my text today because what I'm going to try to do with our study of Genesis, the days of Noah, is what Jesus gave us in Matthew uh, 24, 37 through 39. The comparison, he said, as it as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be just like, just like the days of the Son of Man. So the, the days of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And I found that to be an interesting idea. And so I'm going to study over the next few weeks, we're going to study the days of Noah. Uh, for these will be just like the days of the coming of the Son of Man out of Matthew, which we'll talk about today. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, let's open them to Matthew, the 24th chapter. And, and the, the greater context of this study of Matthew 24, 37, 38, 39 that I'm just going to read from, the greater context is the parable of the fig tree which starts in verse 32 and goes through 41. I'm just pulling a segment out of that because that's not where I'm going to study at this time. I'm just going to pull some information to show you that Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be uh, like in the days of the Son of Man. I, but I need to tell you the greater context so you can look at the greater context of which Jesus was speaking from. Now, we're looking at, at Matthew 24, 37, 38, 39. And here's what he said. This is Jesus speaking. He said, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And he explains, for as in those days, days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man be. So the coming of the Son of Man will be. So we're going to look at, over the next few weeks, we're going to look at the days of Noah in detail because he only gave us a very general idea. They were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. So we're going to study those because he says the days of Noah are a foreglimpse of the days of the Son of Man, that is the return of Christ, as we learn in Matthew. As we learn in Matthew. And that one of the key words in verse 39, they did not understand the importance of getting saved by the grace gospel, the prophetic gospel of Jesus Christ, that one day he would come, die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. The third day, you had to, in that day, you had to believe in a prophetic gospel in order to be saved. Noah preached that prophetic gospel, and they didn't understand the importance while well, he spent 120 years to build an ark and preach the message, nobody understood the urgency or the importance of the message until Noah actually and his family actually entered into the ark and the flood came. And then it was too late. That's the point, I suppose, that Jesus is making. It's important we live in the days of the Son of Man. Christ has come the first time, 
and he's coming a second time. First time, second time. Matthew is talking about the coming of the Son of Man that will take man away. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. And the importance is to understand that like in the days of Noah, it is important to understand the urgency of the message of grace salvation. We live in the days of the Son of Man, the urgency and importance of the historical gospel that he came, died on a hill called Golgotha. For our sins was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. The urgency, they did not understand the urgency of the message of the gospel of grace salvation until it was too late. I hope that's not true with you. And so our message today is a very important message out of Genesis 6.3. I'm going to give that, and then we're going to have a word of prayer. Now, I, I want you to, I'm in Matthew, so I want you to go all the way over the first book to Genesis. We're going to look at the sixth chapter and verse 3. Because he tells you that God did a very important thing in the days of Noah that he's doing similar in the days of the Son of Man. Then the Lord said, I meant Genesis 6, 3, My spirit, Holy Spirit, shall not strive with man forever. The Holy Spirit was sent to the days of Noah to strive with mankind until the flood. My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Notice he went from, went from days to years. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now, my point of my message today is God sent the Holy Spirit. How did the Holy Spirit work in the age of the Gentiles? The Bible says it strived with man. It pleaded the cause of God to mankind. The, Holy, it, the Hebrew word din, D-I-N, strive. Pleaded the cause of God to man, the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about that today because the Holy Spirit plays an enormous role in the days of the Son of Man in which you and I live. We live in the days of the Son of Man. We live between his first coming and his second coming. So when you put those two eyes together, and so I'm going to do a study on the striving of the Holy Spirit in the days of Noah where God sent his spirit to plead the cause of grace salvation. Let us pray. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. You've given in to the lust of the flesh and committed sin. That's carnal. It, the Holy Spirit dwells inside you so that you could be spiritual. But you've chose not to walk in the spirit. You've chose to walk in the flesh and fulfill the desires of it. Personal sin. Could be mental attitude types of sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality and back to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? I confess my sin. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Cleansing us takes us back to the cross. It's the blood that cleanses us from sin. We go, it takes the believer to the cross, not for salvation this time, but for sanctification. 
When he came the first time to the cross, it was for justification. The second time he comes, the third time, fourth time, however often he needs to confess his sin, he comes back to the cross for sanctification. I confess my sin. The blood of Christ cleanses me and restores me to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, and 17, the Holy Spirit is in me and can never live me, leave me. He is there forever, ever, forever. So let's do that. Every believer is a priest under the new covenant church age, 1 Peter 2. You have the privilege to confess your sins as a priest to God, to be restored to sanctification, to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Give you a moment of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way today by the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls today about this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. We're in those days of the Son of Man. And what was the great, what did God send to the world to plead the cause of man? It was the Holy Spirit. Who does it today? The Holy Spirit except this time is called the conviction in John 16, 7 through 11, the Holy Spirit's conviction work of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us today uh, of the urgency of our ambassadorship as custodians of evangelism and the word of God. It is our responsibility to plead the cause under the ministry of the Holy Spirit for the urgency of grace salvation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, remember, we're, we're going to the, to the study of Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9 after we leave uh, today, uh, Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, I remind you, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. In the Old Testament and in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, they did not understand there was a first and second coming of Christ. They just understood that there was a coming of Christ and all of this would take place. But what they didn't know is that the church would be the mystery between the first and second coming of Christ. You need to read Ephesians, the third chapter. It talks about the mystery of the church in great detail, by the way. Well, they didn't understand that in that day. They understand it now because when Jesus left in, in Acts 1, 11, he said, I'm going to return like I left. And so... In, in Matthew 24, 37, 38, 39, when he's talking about this in the parable of the fig tree, he talks about the coming of the Son of Man like, like it was in the days of Noah. There was a specific day when it was over. For the days of Noah, it was when Noah entered the ark and the flood came. In the second coming of Christ, it will be when Jesus removes the church and comes back, which will be the tribulation and all of that. And when he returns in the second coming, the civilization will be destroyed by fire. Like the first civilization was by water. The first civilization of the days of Noah was called the antediluvian, the, the civilization before the flood. You and I live in the post-diluvian period, the day after the flood. And when Jesus comes a second time, the civilization will not be destroyed, the post-diluvian will not be destroyed by water, it will be destroyed by fire, 2 Peter 2 and 3. You need to read 2 Peter, 3rd chapter. If you're interested in that, then somewhere you ought to be. Now, 
I'm going to look at five things this morning on the study of the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit called striving, pleading the cause for God in the antediluvian period. If you, you ought to have a Bible, get your Bible, get a pencil and get a piece of paper, notebook, take notes. Later, you can go to our website and pull down my notes. But this is classroom. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you. Okay, just give it a heads up. Now, remember, Matthew sets up Genesis 6.3. In Genesis 6.3, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. His days shall be 120 years. Interesting the way he said that, because we're talking about the days of Noah. That's a period of human history. We call it biblical history because we're looking at it from a biblical side, from the divine viewpoint side, not the human viewpoint side. So here's point number one. In Genesis 6-3 that I just read, God issued a warning and a promise to the antediluvian civilization. A warning and a promise. What separates them is the word nevertheless. Look, have you got your Bible? Open it open. Open to, to Genesis, the sixth chapter, verse three. There's a warning and there's a promise. What separates the two in, in God's discussion, what separates two is the word nevertheless. Look at it again. Here's the, here's the warning. The Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. There's the warning. There's the promise. The warning, my spirit will not strive. In the Hebrew, the word not is low. It's a strong negative. And the word strive is din, D-I-N. It's a cal imperfect. In other words, it's going to strive until God says, that's, that's the last day. He's going to give him 120 years. Boom, it's going to be over. And so there was a warning. And uh, who was the Spirit of God striving with? The human beings called here because of flesh. Now, listen, the flood's going to take everything that has flesh. It's going to take man, animals, except for them on the ark. Listen, it wasn't just human flesh that was on the ark. It was all flesh. And that was to repopulate and, and reestablish the post-Diluvian world out of creation. Specimens were carried over to the new, to the new promise of land. Well, we'll study all that. I mean, I'm just introducing that concept to you. We're going to study all that. Here is a verse that's really important for you that covers every dispensation in the Word of God. It shows the character of God and His desire that all be saved, that none perish. Here's the verse. Write it down. 2 Peter 3.9. You should really get that verse in your soul because it's how you plead the case for God to the unbelievers of the days of the Son of Man, the day in which you and I live. Listen what it says. The Lord is not slow about the promise, but is patient towards you, the human race. Not wishing, no desire for any to perish, that's to die without God through Christ. No man can come to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. 
every human being is born perishing because of Adam's sin, John 3.16. The word perish. Jesus Christ takes your perishing on the cross and gives you eternal life from it because of his resurrection. He dies on the cross, 13 judicial charges. One of those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin is perishing. Alienated, blind, cursed, condemned, death, spiritual death, darkness, enmity. A natural man without the Spirit of God in him. Perishing. Ungodly, unrighteous, under the raft of God. The moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin that bring condemnation are removed from your life. Never to be, never to be brought up again ever in time and eternity because Jesus died one death for all time for all people. And when he died, he said, it's finished, it was done. You know that. Right? And so I just read 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, but is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but for all, not some, but for all to come to repentance, metanoia, a change of mind of the source of salvation. It is Jesus Christ who dies on a cross, one death for all time for all people. He was buried and raised from the dead to give eternal life. He's alive. He wants to give you that life, and it's eternal because he's eternal. His resurrection brought him to, into eternal. He sits at the right hand of God the Father in a resurrection body today with all authority, Acts 2.33 that makes him the savior of the body and the head of the church. I'm just saying, you got to study the Bible. You got to study the Bible. You can study it with me. You got to study the Bible. Point number two, the Holy Spirit has a specific ministry in every biblical dispensation. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's what Jesus did in Matthew 24, 37, 38, 39. He divided the four divine, the, the divine uh, dispensations, I call them biblical dispensations, into two parts. Now, there are four. There's Gentile age, the Jewish age, the church age, and the millennial age. He broke them into two sections. In Matthew, Jesus did it. He did it this way. He said, there's the days of Noah, and there are the days of the Son of Man. Now, I broke them down on your paper, but here they are. The days of Noah is the Gentile age. The Gentile age, or the Gentile dispensation. Under the Son of Man, after the flood, the Son of Man... You have the Jewish age, the church age, and the millennial age because they're all wrapped up in the first and second coming of Christ. And I gave you scripture for that, and the Holy Spirit has a unique ministry in each one of them. For example, in the Gentile age, Genesis 6-3, he strived with them. He pleaded, their, he pleaded God's case or cause to them. In the Jewish age, the Holy Spirit abides alongside John 14, 16, and 17. Pay attention to that. He says, he now abides with you and soon will be in you. A and in you is the church age. Jewish age alongside, church age inside. And the millennial age is Joel 2, 28 through 32. The Spirit of God will be poured out. In the millennial age, it will be poured out.
okay. You're going to take notes now, aren't you? <laughs> it's okay. Look, I'm just, if it took you till point number two, okay. Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 divided the four biblical dispensations in two parts. The, son, the, the days of Noah and the days of the son of, of man. In the days of Noah, we have the Gentile dispensation. In the days of the Son of Man, we have the Jewish age, the church age, and millennial age. That deals with the first and second coming of Christ. All right? In the Gentile age, we're told that the Genesis 6-3, the Holy Spirit strived with them. In the Jewish age, in John 14, 16, and 17, and in the church age, you should pay attention to that one verse. You pick them both up. In the Jewish age, he, he uh, abode beside them. In the church age, he dwells inside them. In the millennial age, the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them. Joel, Joel 2, 28-32. Okay? See, you got to know that stuff. I, you say, I've never heard that. I... I what do I know? I don't know who you are and where you go. I know you can hear it here, and I gave you biblical references. So you can't say I don't know after today because you've been told. You've been taught. I gave you the scriptures. What does the Bible say? Okay? The days of Noah had a limitation for the striving of the Holy Spirit which he said, not forever, nevertheless, 120 years. We are told in the days of the Son of Man that we do not know, we don't have any limitation like that. We do not know the hour or the day of the coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming. We do know that when it occurs, the rapture will occur of the church, the tribulation will come in, and the millennial age. Now, we know that. But we don't know the hour of the day. We don't know. Matthew 24, 36. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, the mystery. The rapture of the church is part of the mystery of the church. You know, you can go back to our website and you can pick this whole lesson up, listen to it, listen to it, and take down all the notes. You can listen to it over. You should listen to it more than one time and get it, look up the scriptures and, and know what the Bible says about it. Point number three, the Holy Spirit strove, strived through 10 generations of the Sethites, Genesis, the fifth chapter. You can read about them in Luke, the third chapter, 36 through 38, the generations from Adam through Seth to Noah. In other words, this antediluvian period, what do we have any account of the people and the generations? Yes, Genesis 5 and Luke 3, 36 through 38, talk about that of the genealogy. In Luke 3, you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ going all the way back to Adam and Seth, to Noah. The Spirit would strive with the human race because of the flesh, the human race. He would strive with the human race from Adam's fall, from Adam, and then Seth, all the way to Noah, 10 generations. The Spirit strived with 10 generations of the Sethites 
as recorded, as I said. The Sephites were the divine agency or custodians of evangelism and the word of God. In theology, we call that a divine agency uh, in a dispensation. Now, it's obvious that in the church age, the church is that divine agency. We are the custodians of evangelism and the word of God. What was God's message to the antediluvian civilization? What was God's message that the Holy Spirit was pleading the cause of? It is the same gospel message that we are pleading the cause with humanity, with the human race, for God. The difference is that prior to Jesus coming historically into the world, it was a prophetic gospel that one day Christ would come and he would die on a cross for the sins of man. He would be buried and raised from the dead the third day. It was a prophetic gospel. Today, in the, day, in the days of Noah, today in the days of the Son of Man, in the church age, we preach he came. Died on a hill called Golgotha for the sins of the human race, past, present, and future. Was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. We even have historical f account of it. It was at Pentecost during unleavened bread, first fruits to Pentecost. We've studied that. How do I know that? Well, here's how you can know about this cause. Romans, the fifth chapter, tw uh, 12 through 21. Wherefore is by one man Adam, sin entered the world and death by sin. That's spiritual. And so it passed upon all men, for all men have sinned. Sinned in Adam. They're a sinner in Adam. And the only way out is through Jesus Christ. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Death on the cross, burial, resurrection, called the gospel. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man boast. The boast goes to God and to the work of Christ on the cross. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8, it tells you how Abraham got saved by a prophetic gospel. The scriptures, I'm going to come back to that, but you hold that idea. The scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. What scriptures, with a capital S, existed in canonization of some form before Abraham in Genesis 12? There were scriptures in existence considered canonized before Abraham. That be that's because they came from the Sethites who gave it to the Shemites, one of the sons of Noah, when he walked off the ark, to Abraham, who was a Shemite that became a Hebrew, a Jew, and the Jewish age. That's the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. The Gentiles, those outside the Sethites, those outside the divine agency, the Gentiles, the Gentiles outside of, of the Jew Abraham, they're a Jew and Gentile with Abraham. Abraham, a Gentile, now established another race called the Jews. Well, the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham, saying all nations will be blessed in you. The word you there, Y-O-U, is not Abraham, it's Christ, 
Galatians 3.16. See, I'm reading Galatians 3.8. Over in 16, it says you, the seed of the you, the seed, was singular, not plural. I'm just telling you what Paul wrote. Point number four. There were three different races in the antediluvian period. There were three different races that the Holy Spirit strove with during this period of the antediluvian before the flood. Now, we'll study these three races in detail when we go to Genesis and over the week study that we will learn that the Holy Spirit strived with three different races of people during the antediluvian civilization. We will know that they were the Canaanites, Cain and Abel, the Canaanites in Genesis 4, the Sethites in Genesis 5, and the Nephilims in Genesis 6 through 9. And what was the Holy Spirit doing? Striving? He was pleading God's cause for their need to be saved by, the great, by a prophetic gospel of grace. Point number five. In spite of the striving ministry of the Holy Spirit to the antediluvian civilization, evil permeated it and corrupted it to the point that only one, only one family believed the gospel of grace, salvation, and weren't destroyed by the flood. By one family, it was Noah's family with three sons, three married sons. I talked about it as one family. We will read about that in Genesis 6 through 9. And God told, God told Noah and the group of believers, you have 120 years. And so for 100 years, they, 120 years, they built the ark and preach the message of grace, salvation, and the offer to the offer of grace. A free ride from one world to another. A free ride. Free in the sense of grace. You can write, listen, if you believe in G that that Christ would come. One day and die for your sins, be buried and raised from the dead. If you will believe that, you can enter the ark and be rescued from a flood death and eternal separation from God. Listen, as a pastor out there, when you get discouraged about how many people you got in church, Think about Noah, 120 years preaching. But thank God he won his own family to Christ. But he didn't get another convert. Not one. In the early days, he got converts of a girl who married a son, a girl who married a son, a girl who married a son. He got over all the years of preaching and the Holy Spirit striving, pleading the cause. Only three people outside the family of Noah got married and they were the girls that married the sons. At least Noah didn't let him marry somebody that wasn't a believer that could ride out with him. The storm. You know, it's interesting. God describes Noah. 
The Bible says he was a righteous man, meaning he was right with God and right with people. He was blameless. And he was a man who walked with God on a consistent basis. And is a man who found favor with God. When you study the life of Noah, God tells you the character that God's interested in. And listen, this is the type of person you've got to be in an evil, permeated, corrupted civilization. And then your message is most likely to fall on deaf ears. And you must stay true to the Lord and not go the way of the world. For the way of the world is the lake of fire in the final judgment of the great white throne. Well, just telling you, last 120 years, Noah built an ark and preached the word. The Holy Spirit pleaded the cause. The ark was completed. One family got in it. The flood came and no one else got in it. What a sad, what a sta sad story that is. Yet it's become one of the great famous stories of the Bible taught to children because of the animals paired up and all went into the ark. And no humans except Noah's families. What a sad day. What a sad story. Unless the ark is all about having faith in Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he can carry through the storms of life and the floods that come through the safety of the promised land. If that's not part of that story, that is not a good story, is it? Listen, he didn't rescue all the animals, just enough to start another civilization with. The lesson we must learn from the study of the days of Noah is how to battle evil and to have victory over evil in the days of the Son of Man. Therefore, you should read Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, how to battle evil. And 1 John 4, 4, how to have victory. Then you ought to add 1 John 5, 4, how to have victory. In 1 John 4, 4, you're introduced to the great ministry of the Holy Spirit during the days of the Son of Man. Greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he, Satan, who is in the world. Who in the fifth chapter of 1 John 5, 19 is described as the evil one. That's where evil comes from. And evil corrupts man in his ideas of God and Jesus Christ and, and corrupts his mind. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 to the gospel. Hardens it, darkens it, hardens it so they cannot see the light of God in Christ for salvation. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in the days of the Son of Man in which you and I live is found in John 16, 7 through 11. The Holy Spirit, when he comes in the days of the Son of Man, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he goes on to explain it. 
And when this helper comes, he will take up residence inside a church age believer's life and will never leave. He is there forever. That was made very clear. It would be that way in the days of Noah. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. 1 John 5.4. I didn't put it on the paper. 1 John 5.4. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, the faith cycle. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you, the Holy Spirit, than he who is in the world, Satan, 1 John 4, 4. Our introduction through the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 24 to the days of Noah. Study the days of Noah, he says, for they will be similar in the days of the Son of Man. And so we're going to do that. We are going to do that to try to understand that we should have, as Christians, we should have the discernment between good and evil. And I'm not confident the church can discern it anymore because the world calls good evil and evil good. And if you don't have the Bible to clear, clarify what is evil and what is good, you're in deep trouble as far as discerning. So over the next few weeks, we're going to study this. We're going to look at the days of Noah. So that we might come to understand what we have to battle and where our victory is. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today to study with us the days of Noah from the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 24. Over the next few weeks, Father, as we look at the days of Noah, to try to come understand the evil that we battle as good people. We got to have the ability through the word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the days of the Son of Man to discern between good and evil. And so we'll do that to the best of our ability. We'll study it, look at it, and compare it to how we have to battle to bring victory to Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.